Johan is the Professor of Historical and Systematic Theology at the University of Oxford. And we've already had some of us a fascinating afternoon with him uh, looking at the intersection between what it is to be both a historian and a theologian. And in some ways, uh, there's, uh, it, this is the you know, perfect mix of knowledge of the places that theology has come from and knowledge of what theology is embodied in this discipline, historical and systematic theology. Previously, Johann has uh, held positions at Humboldt University in Berlin. And his two main areas of expertise are late, late ancient Christian theology, um, together with the philosophical, together with its philosophical background, and 19th century Christian thought. His current work is focused on notions of individuality in post-Chalcedonian theology, on theological and non-theological understandings of sacrifice, and on the relationship of memory and forgetting. Bit of a polymath is Johann. Johann has studied theology in Rostock, Berlin and Oxford, where he was awarded his DPhil in 1998 with a thesis on Gregory of Nyssa, and he also holds a habilitation from hum Humboldt University. It's um, really great to have him talking on tonight's topic. The whole notion of heresy has become a little bit contested and fraught in our age, and I think such an excellent way into it, looking at the wisdom of the ancients. Thank you very much for your time with us, Johan. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Andrew, for these kind words of introduction. It is a great pleasure really to be here. It is my first ever visit to Australia and thus by implication my first ever visit to Canberra. Um, and I've really been overwhelmed not just by the beauty of the country but really also by the kindness and the hospitality of everybody um, I've met. I'm really delighted to be speaking to you tonight on a topic that touches on a number of the research interests that I have, um, on which Andrew um, spoke a moment ago. But in a way, it is also um, an attempt that I've been making um, to address an important theological issue in today's church. It is really an attempt to be theological by drawing on various aspects of Christian history. So the contemporary issue, and of course it's not just a contemporary issue, but the contemporary issue that I am um, interested in and that I'm, I'm addressing in my talk is the problem of Christian identity. It's not, not a new uh, problem, but I think in some ways it has become um, a particularly burning issue for many people, certainly all over the Western world, if we use that in a very general sense, and it's probably also an issue in many other parts of our globalized world. Why is that so? Well, I think it is fair to say that in, again, certainly many parts of the West, a generation or two ago, practically everybody who was Christian of a particular um, um, denomination would in the first instance and normally explain their identity in terms of their upbringing or in terms of their descent. So if I were Catholic, that would normally indicate that my parents and my family had been Catholic and sometimes even more broadly, for example, I'm Irish or I'm Polish, and so evidently then I am, uh, I am a Catholic or I'm from Sweden or from Finland and my um, religion would be Lutheran. Now I'm not saying that that has completely and utterly gone away, but again, to different, um, to different extent, it has certainly changed in most parts of the Western world. Um, and so the question of why 
Am I what I am, what makes up the, my own religious identity and the identity of a religious group, of a church or a, a religious community is really, is, is much more open and causes people in my own experience um, sleepless nights or at least um, they have to think about it for a long time. Um, time. Now, one of the things that inevitably happens when religious identity, not just religious identity, but when religious identity becomes problematic and more open-ended is that certain mechanisms of identity formation come into play. And one particularly important mechanism for identity formation that comes into play when that kind of identity formation happens um, is, is exclusion. Now, at one level, you may say that isn't even something particularly noteworthy or something extraordinary. Uh, what I mean is that very often people find it much easier in order to explain who they are to say who they are not, right? So if you, uh, if you live in uh, Britain and you want to um, explain really what it means to be English, then in some ways it's, it's almost easiest to say that, you know, it means not being French, for example, right? And of course, that's, that's, how, it, that's how things have, de have developed over the centuries, and one could say something similar uh, for the, um, for example, for the identity of all European nations, and I would be very much surprised if one couldn't say something similar for the emergence of the Australian nation as well, but I'm not going to pontificate on that um, because you all know that much better than I do. So at one level, that is um, not so much um, perhaps a problem, it's almost uh, something that goes without saying. Likewise, um, you know, being, being a Catholic in certain parts of Europe, perhaps it's almost most easily explained by saying, you know, I am not a Protestant, and somehow you know what the others are, and so you know what you um, are yourself by um, differentiating you from those um, other people. So you might think it's nothing big to mention, but of course it is. And one of the reasons it is not quite as innocent as I've just made it sound is that this um, identity formation by exclusion usually doesn't really happen without projecting quite a bit of negativity on the other group. Of course, you know, at one level you might say um, defining your identity by exclusion is simply a matter of saying I'm different or we're different from that other group, but as a matter of fact it usually doesn't quite end there, but you want to say that, you know, we're better or there's something really wrong with those other people and that's really giving us a better sense of why we're on the right track. And if you then along, uh, you know, look, look further along those lines, you know, why is it that the, the English would define themselves against the French? Well, of course, that's not unrelated to the fact uh, that they've been in constant warfare um, for, for many centuries, right? So, so the identity formation by way of exclusion is pretty much tied up with stigmatization and scapegoating of, of, of other groups and very often also with um, um, war and, and violence. And that is, again, you know, you might say I'm not saying something particularly exciting or novel, but it's obviously something that is equally true for the history of religion in general and for the history of Christianity in particular. But we all know that it isn't something that anybody should really simply take for granted because if we look at the... Um, at the arguments that opponents of religion or critics of religion bring against religion, critics of Christianity bring up against Christianity, then I think it's fair to say that one of the most frequent arguments that is used against the claims of religion is exactly the kind of eternal struggle, you know, Christ Christians against 
Jews, Protestants against Catholics, Catholics against Protestants, and so on and so forth. It's clearly one of the most pervasive um, sources, or it's been one of the most pervasive sources of radical, a radical critique or rejection of religion. Now, I would say that that kind of critique, certainly when we're talking um, about Christianity and we look at the history, and in particular, if we try to um, understand what Christianity is all about, then that kind of criticism um, directed at the Christian religion is is entirely fair, I think. It is entirely fair. Um, it's fair because the idea that Christian identity is constructed or is formed or shaped by excluding others is in, a, in an obvious but not at all trivial way incompatible with what Christianity is all about. It is a religion that is all about reconciliation, so how is it compatible with a, a history that brings division and conflict? It is a, relig a religion of love, so how is it compatible with the preaching of hatred and rejection? So that's really the problem I, I'm, I'm addressing in my talk today. How do these two things go together? And what I'm going to do is in a way, in a first step certainly, um, deepen, the pro uh, deepen the problem even further. Um, what I'm going to ask is, is the reality perhaps even more disturbing than we might, you know, we've been seeing it up until this point. What I mean is, is it possible that the need to exclude others, to polemicize about others, to use something or um, 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 refer to something, um, have recourse to something that I call the rhetoric of evil, um, that these things aren't just happening in the way many th unfortunate things, of course, have happened in the history of Christianity, but is it possible that they have to happen? Is there something, is, might it be the case that Christianity, in spite of being the religion of reconciliation and the religion of love, can only find or form its own identity by excluding others? Well, I will suggest that that to some extent is actually the case and I will address this. Um, you have the broad structure of my talk on this on this um, slide. Um, I will address this um, under the heading the ecclesiastical paradox. It is really um, um, a, 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 a deep problem um, if we try to think about what the church is or ought to be from a theological point of view. But in order to get there, um, I now do what's been promised on the poster for my talk and I go back to the early church um, and use um, a historical example to, on the one hand to illustrate the problem, but on the other hand also to get closer to what the problem perhaps is all about. So that brings me to the second point there uh, and I'm going to talk about two major figures in the history of the early church, um, more specifically the doctrinal conflicts about the doctrine of the Trinity which tore the church apart in the fourth century. And the two people are the Alex Alexandrian presbyter Arius, um, who was condemned at the Council of Nicaea in 325, and the bishop um, of Alexandria, um, Athanasius of Alexandria, who um, uh, emerged over the decades as the most ferocious opponent of Arius, Arius' theology, but as we see in a moment, also of Arius as 
a person. Because that's really what I um, want to draw your attention to. I want to talk specifically here about a brief and probably not very well-known text that Athanasius wrote. Um, um, well, we don't know exactly when he wrote it, um, probably at some point in the 350s. Um, the Council of Nicaea had happened in 325, so we're um, a few uh, decades later. We don't know exactly when um, this particular text um, uh, which is called on the um, concerning the death of Arius was written, and it doesn't it doesn't matter so much. But I have to give you a little bit of historical background so you can appreciate uh, what all this is about. Um, in 325, you know, one clearly of the most important dates in the history of the Christian Church, a synod, or as we now say, council, uh, took place in Nicaea really um, modern day Istanbul um, or a, um, 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 a suburb of, of, of Constantinople or today's Istanbul. Um, and in that um, synod, um, one, one of the main outcomes of that synod was that, that the presbyter areas who held a particular view of the Holy Trinity um, was condemned together with his views. Um, what happened afterwards is, is, is more difficult to understand. Pretty soon after the council, his friends and supporters lobbied the Emperor Constantine to make it possible that Arius could be reconciled to the church. And it took several years um, in which this went back and forth, but um, about 10 years, 11 years after the Council of Nicaea in 336, there finally was a synod at which um, Arius duly appeared and in front of the emperor and all the bishops who were convened there, um, distanced himself, repudiated his earlier teaching, and on that basis he was um, readmitted into the church. Well, Athanasius himself was at the time in exile, so he wasn't present at that Senate. Um, the reason he is writing um, the text we are talking about is that a few decades later the question emerged whether Arius had in fact ever been readmitted to the church. Now, it's hard for us to ascertain the historical truth, but it seems to be the case that at some point very soon after the synod that readmitted him uh, into the church, Arius in fact died. Um, now, the point um, Athanasius wants to make in that letter is that Arius died before he was actually readmitted into the church. And so he is talking about his death in a way that makes it very clear that the death of the heretic was brought about by God in order to prevent that this evil man could actually um, join the church at any point in his life. And there's several things that are remarkable about the text. And the first one is that the particular details Athanasius gives, and again we have no way of knowing whether they are historically accurate or not, but it certainly is striking that they are identical to the way Judas is said to have died, not the well-known story where he hangs himself, but um, in uh, the beginning of, of Acts, of the Acts of the Apostles, he's said to have died in a, in a public toilet, and that's exactly what um, um, Athanasius says about Arius, that he um, had to go to a public lavatory, and there he fell over and was dead. And it's very clear that he wants to, he does that, um, to show that he is the new Judas, right? The, as Judas betrayed Christ, so Arius, with his wrong doctrine of the Trinity, betrayed Christ in a theological way. So, so there is clearly an attempt to show that the person who had wrong theological views was also a really bad and terrible person, someone who betrayed Christ as much as um, um, Judas had done that. 
But the actual climax of the letter, which is rhetorically very carefully constructed, um, the actual climax of the letter is, um, is, an ex is, is an account of how the death of Arius was providentially brought about by God. And the way Athanasius knows that is that he um, relates the experience of a bishop who was present at the time. So the way he's um, 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 narrating the event is that it was, everything was planned for Arius to be readmitted to the church, but the night before that happened, um, a certain um, um, Alexander of Constantinople um, is deeply concerned that this terrible thing could actually happen. And so um, Athanasius um, describes that, um, that Alexander of Constantinople prayed. He said the following um, prayer, which you have uh, on the slide. Um, so he prays and says, if Ares is brought into communion tomorrow, let me thy servant depart and destroy not the pious with the impious, but if thou wilt spare thy church, and I know that thou wilt spare, look upon the words of Eusebius and his fellows, these are the friends of Arius, and give not thine inheritance to destruction and reproach and take off Arius, lest if he enter into the church, the heresy also may seem to enter with him, and henceforward impiety be accounted for piety. It's very interesting that the death of Arius becomes a necessity in order to prevent this bad man to enter into the church. And, and you know, to come back to my original um, topic of the rhetoric of exclusion, it's very, very clear what the logic here is, isn't it? The, the logic is that the church can only remain a holy place if not just the heresy, but the heretic himself is excluded. If Arius were to be readmitted, then something terrible would happen to the church. Um, so what we see here is how the exclusion of a particular viewpoint is equated to the exclusion of a person, and it goes so far um, that that person actually should die, dies in very dishonorable circumstances in order to prevent the pollution of the church. Um, can you switch on to the next slide? No, um, exactly. But to see the full significance of what Athanasius is doing there, I think we need to link his particular narrative about the individual areas with his theological and ecclesiastical campaign at that time, which was for the, um, 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 for the um, adoption by the church as a whole of the Nicene Creed. Now the Nicene Creed, you may all think you know it because it's something that's said in church to this day, but I have to tell you that the version you were saying in church isn't actually the creed that was adopted at the Council of Nicaea in 325. One of the differences between the two is that the creed um, of Nicaea didn't just have particular statements of faith, but appended to it had um, a condemnations or anathemas. Um, I put them um, uh, here on this slide for you. Those who say there was a once when he did not exist and before being begotten he did not exist and that he came into existence from non-existence um, or who allege that the Son of God is of another hypostasis or ousia or is alterable or changeable, these the Catholic and Apostolic Church condemns. Now I'm not going to go into all the technical things um, that one isn't allowed to say here because otherwise the paper would last till midnight. Um, but what's important is the, the anathema, of course, is a curse. Um, everybody, and of course that is Arius, um, who has these opinions is placed under the curse. So what I think we get here, and this is why I want to direct your attention to this story of Athanasius on Arius, is that three things are really connected. Um, on the one hand, the need to have let's say, doctrinal clarity to affirm one set of doctrines and reject another set of doctrines. Secondly, the connection of that, those doctrines with individuals, or in this case, one individual. And so 
in order to build a church that's based on one creed, you need to exclude not just views, but ultimately one individual who holds them. And in that sense, I think the story about, you know, Athanasius is reveling in the details of, of Arius' death and his advocacy of this particular creed are, I would say, two um, sides of the same coin. And perhaps if you move on to the next slide, I hope it's the right, it's the right one. Exactly. Now, what that means um, in more... Um, um, perhaps more um, illustrating or more um, iconic um, categories you can see in this um, typical icon that denotes or shows the Council of Nicaea. You find it in many Orthodox churches. It's um, originally from a monastery in today's Greece. And I think what we see there illustrated is um, exactly what I've been trying to explain in the last five or ten minutes. So we have, so you see you have the church, I mean of course it's the Hagia Sophia which didn't, wasn't there in the fourth century so it's not perfectly historical but it's the, uh, it's the, it's the major church and um, around it um, you see the saintly fathers of the Nicene um, Council and the um, church of course is is, is, the, is the cosmos, is the um, realm of light and order and beauty and everything. Um, so it's exactly the place to which everybody wants to belong. But it's very interesting that the only way it can exist is by having a dark figure underneath um, this beautiful structure. This is Arius, right? There's Arius there, cowering there, hidden underneath the, 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 the um, harmonic um, structure. Um, I think it's a perfect illustration of what's been going on in those texts. It's the, it's the, it's the vision of a unified church with Ath which Athanasius, of course, pursued, but which he fully understood could only be achieved by having an other on whom everything that might tear the unity of the church apart could be projected. So perhaps we can go back to the um, first slide, or the, exactly to this one. So that brings me to my third point, but I don't have to say much more about it really, um, except to um, say that I believe that this problem is theologically speaking a very serious one. It's a very serious one because it, you know, the word paradox um, is today often used in a, in, a, in a very loose manner. It's simply used as sort of two ideas that are somehow in tension, in tension with each other. But I, I mean it here in a much stricter sense. I mean it in the sense that we seem to be uh, able, not, not only seem to be able, but have to say with equal justification and with equal necessity two things that don't seem to go together. And one is that the church is the place where people are not excluded, that the church is the place where people are brought together, that the church is the place where the idea of reconciliation and love is put into practice. But at the same time, the example of other Athanasius and Arius um, shows that in reality, the, in order for the church to be constructed as an institution, um, uh, that is based on certain doctrinal ideas and has an, uh, a hierarchical institutional structure, then that uh, process apparently doesn't work without the exclusion of another. Um, and you will perhaps appreciate that the example I've chosen isn't just any example, right? Because the Nicene Creed, I mean, even though it is a little dif different from the one that we use in the church um, each Sunday, is perhaps the most fundamental uh, text that brings Christians together. The uh, developments of the fourth century are of absolutely um, fundamental importance for the um, emergence and the formation of Catholic Christianity, Catholic um, in the very broadest possible sense of that term. 
Um, so throughout the centuries, with every author who wrote about the significance of Athanasius and Nicaea, um, there would also be um, some thought reserved for the wickedness of Arius. You can't seemingly have one without the other. And if we wanted to broaden the picture even further, then, I mean, I've already said that, um, that Arius is clearly connected with Judas, even in Athanasius, and that's a, that's a, a connection that continues through the centuries. But of course, who is Judas? Judas is the Jew, right? And so the idea that Arius is excluded is linked in Christian narrative with the um, idea that in order to have Christianity, you have, you have a, you know, you have also have a rejected nation. Um, so the perhaps darkest chapter in the history of the church, which is that Christian identity is defined by the exclusion of the Jews, is already um, implied or included in this particular um, example. So we get to a really um, difficult problem. It's um, a problem that I think takes us right to the heart of what theologians call ecclesiology. Um, in other words, a theological understanding of what the church is or what the church ought to be. Now, it's a radical problem. And so obviously, people have tried to solve it. Um, I'll move on now to two very prominent attempts to address what I call here the um, ecclesiastical paradox to find solutions for this problem. Well, the first one I call the liberal response. Well, the liberal response, and I could give many examples, but um, let me perhaps leave it in the sort of slightly more abstract. The liberal response is a very simple and straightforward one. The liberal response says the, um, the, the, problem, um, the problem that's emerged over the centuries um, lies with the church as an institution. Um, idea, the idea that in the, um, at the end of times the church as an institution will be superseded by a more perfect spiritual or pneumatological union goes back to the Middle Ages probably, um, but has gathered steam very much in with liberal movements in the 19th and 20th century. Um, and I suspect, you know, today it's the view of any number of people who may not even have particularly theological views. The view being that Christianity is a great thing, but the church is a slightly more problematic thing. And now people may well hold that view, but in order for it to be a proper response to what I call here the ecclesiastical paradox, um, one has to be a bit more precise, and to be more precise in this case means to say um, that the period during which the church as an institution was necessary um, is a limited period, um, but what, com what comes after that may be uh, a, a, an even better realization of what Jesus intended. There are some contemporary theorists who, for example, have looked at secularization through this particular lens and have said, well, you know, at one level, of course, it, it's, it's, it's a problem, we can see it as a problem that um, people are leaving the church or the churches lose influence, or perhaps in another way that's not such a bad thing because the churches have actually always drawn up these divisions and they've always had their heretics and so on and so forth. So perhaps what Jesus really um, wanted to preach um, can actually be realized in a kind of post-ecclesiastical um, 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 age much more than uh, at a time during which institutional churches were much more powerful. I think we shouldn't dismiss that solution too easily. I think there's some deep truth there and what's 
what's legitimate is that I think the people who put forward that kind of response do see that do see that the ecclesiastical paradox is real in the sense that the empirical institutional church cannot be the communion of saints. The empirical church doesn't work without the exclusion of another and the true communion that Jesus wants does. Um, so I think thus far their radical um, approach is not off, far off the mark as far as I'm concerned. But where they go wrong in my view is in a somewhat naive optimism that you just take away the institutional structures of the church and the kingdom of peace arrives. Um, and that's where I would say these liberal thinkers underestimate the true paradox of what I call the ecclesiastical paradox. It doesn't go away simply by dismantling uh, institutional structures of the church. It doesn't go away because the moment um, people come together in one form or another, they will once again exclude others. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing in our own time, right? I mean, we see traditional institutions growing weaker and losing influence and somehow their powers are uh, uh, being, being reduced. But do we therefore see a decline in exclusion or the rhetoric of evil or scapegoating? Not at all. If anything, we might say it gets worse. And why does it get worse? Um, this brings, you know, something I said at the very beginning of my talk. If we might say it gets worse because the question of identity is up in the air uh, and the less people are sure about what their identity is, the more likely they are to look around and define their identity against others. And that is, of course, exactly what um, exclusion um, means. And so, you know, has, has, the, has public debate, whether about religion or about anything, become more peaceful or more loving in our own postmodern times? I think the answer is pretty obvious um, that that is not the case. Um, I just, you know, to bring up one big word here, then could say, fun, use the word fundamentalism. Um, and I think you all know uh, what I mean by that. Interestingly, in this almost post-confessional age, the, the, the um, existence of even radical forms of exclusion amongst uh, 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 people who belong to um, one religion or another has actually increased. So this is, this is why I think the liberal response is, is, is wrong or at least insufficient. It's not insufficient. Um, even though that's the charge of Orthodox Christianity, I think it's not wrong in its radical criticism of institutional of the institutional church. Actually, I think there they are spot on, and they see that there's a real problem there. But where they are wrong is in their naive assumption that you can just take the institution away um, and the problems disappear. There's a reason why the institution came into existence in the first instance, and that's because um, because of the paradox. One could, of course, look at the whole problem in a very different way, and that's what the second, what I call the dogmatic, or I might also say realist response to the problem is. One could look at the problem in the following way. One could say, well, if the, if the exclusion of heretics is inevitable, which is, in a way, what I've been saying, um, if it happens one way or another, isn't then the one question that really matters not whether a heresy is excluded, whether a heretic is excluded, but whether the decision the church makes is the right one or whether it's the wrong one, right? I mean, someone could say, you exclude someone one way or another. If we go back to the fourth century, you exclude areas, but perhaps there were, or not perhaps, there were many people whose object of hatred was actually Athanasius. So, you know, if they had kept the upper hand at the end of the fourth century, then perhaps we would have a very different church in which Athanasius would be seen as an arch heretic. Um, 
difficult to imagine, but perhaps not entirely impossible. But well, my point is a very different church, obviously from the one that we uh, have known throughout history, but not a church without exclusion and, with, and not a church without scapegoating and without um, 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 without the construction of another who has to be kept on the outside. So the dogmatic or, 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 or realist response would say, okay, so exclusion happens one way or another. The real question then is to look at the fourth century who was right? Was, was, was it ultimately Athanasius right? And wasn't the church right to exclude areas? And it is, isn't that really the important lesson to learn from that period? And it would have been the real catastrophe if the opponents had prevailed. That is interesting. That is a position that is um, defended with rhetorical brilliancy and with a lot of emphasis um, by the probably greatest theologian of the 20th century by Karl Barth in the um, second volume of his Church Dogmatics that he published in um, 1935, I think. Um, anyway, in the mid-1930s. In, mid um, um, in this, in, in a whole section, he looks at the church's need to confess the true gospel, and Barth comes to the conclusion that no confession is ever possible without anathematizing somebody. And his argument is very simple. He says, to every, you know, if you have a yes, you have a no. Um, so if you say yes to something, you say no to something else. And Barth denies that that is a particularly evil form of excluding somebody um, because he says, um, the church simply draws a, a line um, and it says up to this point um, you can be part of um, what the church um, teaches or what the church stands for. If you cross that line, you're outside. But obviously you're invited to come back in. Um, I think to see the force of what Bart proposes, um, it's helpful to think um, that it happened um, precisely in Germany in the mid-1930s, and so it happens in close proximity to one of the most um, important acts of confession that happened in Christianity in the 20th century, and that is the um, so-called Barman Confession, of which um, Bart himself was the author. That was a text um, written very much in the same manner that we've seen in the, with the Creed of Nicaea, um, drawing the line between uh, sort of separating the evangelical church from the so-called German Christians, from those people who saw um, the Christian faith in a way aligned with the rise of Adolf Hitler. Now people look back at that event as a real highlight of 20th century um, Protestant history as, a, as an absolutely necessary um, act of self-preservation of the German evangelical church, which was able to say at a, at, a, at a moment of need, you know, this is clearly incompatible with what Christianity stands for, and this is, um, by contrast, what the word of God um, tells us in this moment. And you see why I'm saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that because it's, of course, one thing to rail in, in abstract terms about a dogmatic um, uh, church that, that, that excludes people. But the moment we look at the particular case, uh, one that's still historically close to us, we realize, you know, there are evidently moments when probably most or all people today looking back at it and say, you know, whatever, whatever went wrong at that time, this particular um, defining line or dividing line uh, that the um, um, confessing church drew um, was necessary and right. So was Bart then simply right? Well, I think, I think nevertheless he wasn't. And the reason I think he wasn't is that in the light of these confrontations, 
in the light of these confrontations, but lost a clear sense of, let's say, the ambiguity that is inherent in the institutional church at any point in its history. The interesting thing is, if one looks at Carbart's earlier writings from the 1920s, when he was confronted with a kind of normal early 20th century bourgeois Protestant church, he had a much better eye for the fact that even though the church is there to preserve the word of God, the church is also always failing that task. He seems to have lost that a little in the struggles of the 1930s. Now, why is that significant? Um, one of the, one of the um, short com shortcomings the um, confessing church is often criticized for is that even though they were courageous in opposing the attempt to unify Protestantism under the Nazi flag, they didn't really, they weren't really very open to the problems facing the Jews in Germany at the time. No one can of course say, well, you know, they couldn't have done everything and that's, that's fair enough and it's very easy for us to look back and say, why didn't they do more um, if none of us has ever been in the situation in which these pastors were, that you were preaching your sermon on Sunday and then the Gestapo came and took you to jail. Um, but I do think that the fact that there was no perception of the persecution of the Jews shows a deeper problem. And the deeper problem is that for all the good that the Bauman Confession um, in its resistance against the German Christians did, um, its resistance was very church-centered. It was ultimately about the protection of the institutional church against the threat against that institutional church by a, by a state. Now, that was a justified defense, but it did lead, and I think this is where we can see why the dogmatic or, pra or, or, or um, a realist response to the ecclesiastical paradox also fails. It, it leads or led to um, um, to a, a, a view of the church that that is very strongly um, focused on the preservation of its own structures. And it's very, very interesting. Now, the one theologian perhaps most people today um, associate with that period in German history, and I'm speaking, of course, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, that Bonhoeffer was a sharp critic of what he saw uh, happen in the confessing church at the time. Um, uh, and his vision of what he calls a church for others, I think is exactly, in my view, is exactly a reflection of how the confession of Barman, you know, didn't just not go far enough, but created a problem while trying to solve another one. It answered, it responded to the threat to the institutional church by an attempt to shore up that institutional church. And I think Bonhoeffer, I mean, one of the reasons he is the major figure from that period is because he saw that that was a very, very dangerous path to take. And, you know, the, 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 the problematic results were, could, could be seen in many ways in, in post-war developments, but that's not really what I'm supposed to be talking about at length. So the dogmatic or realist response fails as well. And why does it fail? It fails ultimately, I think, for the same reason the liberal response fails. It fails because it underestimates the paradox. It underestimates that the ecclesiastical paradox is a paradox and that by emphasizing the institutional integrity of the church, the church fails the radical call for openness, inclus inclusion, um, and, um, and, and, and love of neighbor that is um, in, enclosed in the, um, in the religion of Jesus in Christianity. So up until here, of course, all I've offered you are two responses to a deep-seated 
problem with our understanding of the church and neither of them seems to work particularly well. So how can we deal with it instead? And you'll be relieved to see not only that we are nearing the end of um, the end of my um, lecture tonight, but also that at the end of what I'm offering you, there is a um, there is an item called solution. Now that's disappeared, but anyway, it was there um, a, a minute ago. Um, exactly, I have six solutions. So now now we come to the solution. But the solution can't be one um, in which one of the two um, sides of this paradox is simply taken away. So instead. Um, what I feel we need to do, or what I want to um, propose tonight, or what I want to um, put to you, really, um, as an attempt to think about how we move on from here, in a way coming after these various historical excursions back to our own time and our own place. Um, so I'm concluding with a number of theses um, that um, can help us think through um, the consequences of what I've called the ecclesiastical paradox. So now, exactly now, the first one's on this slide, and I read it out for you. The institutional church cannot as such be the communion of saints. At the same time, however, the communion of saints cannot exist in the world without such an institutional structure which is required to enable and guarantee the proclamation of the gospel. The temptation to abolish the institution or condone its factual abolition is therefore treacherous and must be resisted as much as any tendency to confound or identify the church's institutional preservation with its evangelical mission. So what you see I'm trying to do is to say we have to live with this paradox. We cannot simply think that we take away one side or the other and be happy with it. So the first point I would say is we have to accept that in a way both is true. There is something deeply problematic about an institutional structure of the church. But that doesn't mean that taking it away would actually improve anything because somehow the proclamation of the gospel, which we might say is the central idea of Christianity is only made possible by the existence of the church. So what does that mean in practice? Well, as I'm, um, tr I've tried to express it in this, um, in this first thesis, um, even, when we get ups even when we get upset about the church, even if we think, gosh, if only these bishops wouldn't exist any longer, um, we shouldn't give in to that temptation, not just not actively, but also not by um, passively um, not doing anything about a weakening of the church as a community as, and as an institution. But at the same time, we also mustn't give in to the tendency which the church as any institution has to um, self-aggrandize, to identify itself with what's ultimately promised as a Christian communion, um, but need to retain a very critical perspective on this form in which we have the Christian community today. So can we move on to the next one? So. So the next point, um, my next thesis is this. The evangelical promise that evil is overcome and the proclamation of the gospel is a liberating force permitting those who believe in it openly to face their own shortcomings and collaborate in the work of God's spirit. The more the church is able to use but not enjoy her forms of organization, the more credible and the more authoritative will be her proclamation of the word. So somehow the church and in both the institutional church as well as individual Christians um, should, be, should, should, be, should be looking um, at the 
um, at the institutional existence of the church, not as a good in itself, but as um, a force that permits doing that what the gospel is actually proclaiming. Um, I think, I hope at least, what I say at the end of this second thesis is almost self-evident. The church, all the churches today, are most revered, are most accepted, the more they're seen to do um, the works of the gospel in the world, and the more these, they are seen to promote their own well-being, the more their credibility suffers. And I think that is not just pragmatically true, but it is right and just. Um, the next slide. Um, so my third thesis, in a way, goes back to um, the way we look at a figure like Athanasius from today's perspective. I would say the same freedom that comes from the gospel also allows us to escape an either or a condemnation or celebration when, it, when we come to figures of Christian history. So we should be able to look at someone like Athanasius without the need to say that he must have been right in every way. But, I, but we shouldn't either give in to the tendency and see him as a horrible person who only um, you know, was, was trying to exclude or suppress um, someone like Arius. He was, as much as we are, trying in his own time to do the work of God. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the capacity to see how he fell short of that um, need and that challenge. And the last one, I think. So the last one is about what all this has to do with theology. Theology finds its proper role within the church where it is transformed from a tool justifying the exclusion of heretics into a theory of Christian practice. The truth of the creeds and confessions is tantamount to their ability to orient the church's life as well as the lives of individual believers towards Christ and thus towards the suffering other. This is not, however, achieved by an attempt actively to abandon more traditional modes of theological thought. Rather, those modes must be affirmed insofar as they can fulfill the task of theology but not for their own sake. So once again, I try to go a kind of middle way and say um, the, the critique of theology that is often comes with the liberal response to the ecclesiastical paradox is legitimate, is legitimate um, insofar as there is a, a form of theology that is bound up with a particular institutional reality of the church, and that form of theology has to be challenged. But it doesn't mean that theology therefore should be abandoned or should even just be transformed into a quasi-secular discourse, but we need to work with the traditions that we have in order to turn theology into um, a, a tool that helps Christians in their practical fulfillment of the uh, gospel of the love of the neighbor. Um, and I think that is all, is there? Um, so with these, with these four theses, which are in a way less, which are in a way less definitive answers, because we don't have definitive answers, but more indicating a direction in which we can go by dealing with this ecclesiastical paradox, um, I want to conclude my lecture tonight. What really is important from my perspective is that when we look at the way the exclusion of heretics has played a role in the 
um, history of the Christian church is that we are sufficiently critical to see that there's been something deeply problematical that's gone on there. But we are naive and assume that we are automatically in a stronger and better position today um, to, to get on without that. In, in many ways, I think we look back to the experience of those who've gone on before us in the history of the church as sisters and brothers, um, not as teachers or judges. Um, and we need to understand that as much as they were trying to um, find their own way through the paradoxical nature of the situation of the church in the world, um, as much um, are we in a similar situation today. Thank you very much for your patience and for listening. Thank you, Johan. Uh, Johan is willing to take a few questions, and as always, I'm going to um, grab the first one. Um, this might not be a fair question, but I'm wondering if um, you've given any thought in a lot of your th theses to um, how Bart might have better affected Barman. What what would uh, what might he have if, if you what might he have done differently? Sorry, can you say that again? Who? So so Bart and Barman. Yep. Um, I'm wondering if, in the light of your theses. You have any thoughts about what might he have done differently? Yeah. Well, no. Thank, thank you. That's that's. I think that's an entirely fair question, um, and and let me start answering it by saying again that I want to be careful. You know, I don't want to go against my own whatever it was, second or third thesis, and stand here as a judge, and in particular not stand here as a judge of people who operated, obviously, in a, under very, very difficult circumstances. And I think managed to do something that was important and, in my view, in an unqualified sense, the right thing to do. But I would say I don't have to... I don't have to be the um, 21st century judge of their shortcomings to answer your question because I would go back um, to a name I mentioned in my lecture and that name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer who I think you know, to me exemplifies um, exactly what could and arguably should have happened at the time and I think uh, I think you know, Bonhoeffer's entire work in the late 30s and all early 1940s is, I think, one large answer to, 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 to this question. I think, I think, well, that's at least my reading of his, um, of his contribution. I think Bonhoeffer increasingly became aware of the massive danger that the confessing church was steering into because they in a way equated the opposition to the Nazis, or at least to the religious policies of the Nazis, of course they weren't all politically really opposed to the Nazis, um, with the imperative of strengthening the um, ecclesiastical structures and, and the institutional structures. Um, why? Because, because sooner or later he realized people would come to the realization that only about 50% of what the church did at the time was really in the service of people, of society, and the other 50% was self-serving, was a kind of hope that the moment the times get really bad, people would come back and would suddenly realize that they'd been naughty and not coming to church on a regular basis, um, and that they would knock on the door and say, please let us back in. And, you know, there's something that I've come to believe over the years, and I obviously cannot prove it. Um, but, and I cannot prove it because, um, as, you, as you all know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer didn't survive the Second World War. But I am firmly convinced that the reason Bonhoeffer increasingly came to a fairly radical form of criticism of what the confessing church did was because he saw um, 
you know, he, he, he anticipated what the post-war period, of course, in reality brought, which was um, an even more radical form of secularization and a, and a perception of the church. And, and ironically, I mean, you know, I can tell you that as somebody who grew up at a time when the old members of the confessing church were still um, around, um, um, in some ways they were terrible people. I mean, they were, uh, they become, they were authoritarian. They had a clear sense of um, of entitlement and they, they, they continued along those lines after the war and in some ways I think um, a lot of the really you know, disastrous consequences for, for German Protestantism you know, was ultimately a, a result uh, precisely of that and, and um, you know, I said you know, there's something I, I believe and I can't prove but I think that is exactly what Bonhoeffer um, anticipated. He saw that there was a huge risk in choosing this path that could in the short term absolute, in a way, deliver what they expected. It could, in the short term, shore up the institutional stability, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't solve that problem in, in the longer term. And this is, um, you know, I say I can't prove it, but of course I'm not just making it up. Um, this is, in my view, what comes out of the famous um, 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 fragments from prison, where Bonifa interestingly goes in this very radical uh, direction of thinking about um, Christianity, you know, religion, less Christianity, which I think, in some ways, is a, is, a, is an extreme form of, of of thinking about thinking about the church, which I didn't really um, have the time to address um, in my lecture, uh, but which I think. Um, uh, is, is actually perhaps one of the most helpful, um, 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 one of the most helpful um, sets of ideas that have been suggested to um, church and theology in the past um, half century. <laughs>